Hello there and welcome to the Georgian Room at the beautiful Royal Institution in London. My name is uh, Rohan Francis, I'm a consultant cardiologist in Essex and I'm joined today by uh, Zabina Hossenfelder who's a physicist from Frankfurt and uh, both of us uh, are also YouTubers. We both have channels where we, we talk about different scientific concepts but our backgrounds are somewhat different in that I come from the world of medicine and, and you from physics, although we, we both have an interest in each other's field. Um, and so the Royal Institution very kindly invited us here today to, to have a bit of a, a discussion about possible ways our fields overlap. Uh, so, Zabina, uh, thanks very much uh, for, for joining me. Uh, what are some kind of applications of, of physics within the world of medicine that, that particularly interest you? One example which I've always found very exciting is that you can use particle accelerators to treat cancer, which is something that a lot of people don't really know about. Um, so usually um, cancer treatments would work with radiation therapy, so electromagnetic waves, but you can also do it with particles um, that have to have a fairly high velocity, which is why you need the particle accelerator for it. And the benefit of doing this is that they will deposit the energy in the tissue in a very targeted range, um, and that's particularly useful for um, brain tumors. And there are quite a few particle accelerators which have a side program where they will actually treat patients. Uh, now, of course, you know, running <laughs> these particle accelerators is hugely expensive and there are only, you know, a dozen people per year which uh, will get treated. But th I think there's quite some potential uh, in this whole area because you can try to <laughs> shrink these accelerators and then maybe treat more patients. Um, I've, I've also had uh, colleagues who worked on statistical mechanics and um, hydrodynamics. Mm -hmm. um, they've been working on these uh, microfluidic devices for the lab on a, sh on a chip. Mm -hmm. um, so there's general, generally this whole diagnostic area where there's uh, a lot of physics. And also, of course, um, imaging methods. I mean, there are the classical ones like magnetic resonance imaging, uh, X-rays, ultrasound. Uh, but there, there are also some uh, newcoming technologies. Yeah, I mean, so I, th I think it would be fair to say that, that medical physics as a field, which is it, itself really only a fairly recent kind of label for this, this particular uh, area where, where physics and medicine overlap, is certainly dominated by imaging. I'd say that, that the majority of people working in medical physics are either involved in, in imaging or in therapeutics that you've, you've mentioned sort of both of those. And certainly my specialty is, is very imaging dependent. And the modalities we tend to, to use most commonly are ultrasound um, for echocardiograms, um, CT scanning and, and MRI, uh, and conventional X-ray is sort of less so these days. And um, th there's a lot of uh, sort of uh, very rapidly uh, developing technologies with, within imaging. Sometimes the relationship between physicists and, and, and medics um, can maybe run into a, a couple of um, blind alleys. Um, and I say this with a great deal of affection and, and um, n nothing, nothing bad intended here, but sometimes I think when you come from a, a different background, so sometimes I think from, uh, let's call it a, a harder science um, than, than medicine, you know, that the living, uh, biology can be a bit more messy. I think sometimes people coming from that background can make the mistake of treating the human body like, well, it's just basically an advanced code and you know DNA is, is just like any other code. We can de decipher it pretty easily and the human body is just a machine. And I, I, I understand the mentality there and I think one day we probably will be able to, to, to say that but I think we're a long way from that. And I, I think sometimes that leads to misconceptions about how, maybe a little oversimplistic, it, it, it can um, uh, it fall down in practice when, when the human body and all its kind of complications and um, intricacies maybe isn't quite as straightforward as, as um, those from maybe, a, say, a coding background would think. Yeah, I, I certainly agree with this. And I, I think an extreme example of this is 
consciousness, <laughs> where there, there are lots of physicists who have like really great ideas about how to quantify consciousness, because you know the brain is just a network and there are chemical reactions and electrical signals and, and so on and so forth. So certainly you can find a way to just measure it and then you can figure out if someone is conscious or not. And uh, uh, you know th those are all highly theoretical ideas and I think they're just thousands of years off mm. uh, any practical applications. So it's not that I'm trying to say it's something that shouldn't be done because um, as you just said, you know, at some point probably we'll get there. Maybe one day it will work. But if I look at what they're doing right now, I just think it's way, way too naive. Yeah, yeah. I think particularly the brain, uh, our understanding of it is, is so poor to just say, well, it's just a bunch of chemical reactions and, and electrical pathways is, is, is just too simplistic. I think uh, when we talk about physics and medicine, there is this emphasis on, on imaging, but this kind of goes way back. And obviously the, the overlap between these fields um, far predates any kind of uh, medical imaging. When you think about things like uh, fluid dynamics and, and the behavior of, of gases and things in the body, and again, you know, within cardiology you can be divided into plumbers or electricians and I'm, I'm a, of the plumbing variety. So fluid dynamics is, is something that I spend most of my day um, thinking about um, and can get really complicated, way, way over my head. Um, and I, I think it's a, a really nice illustration of the kind of intertwined history when you go back to someone like Leonardo da Vinci. And the story that I wanted to share was 500 years ago uh, um, he had watched some water flow through a, a dike and saw little vortices form in the water. And he'd also noticed that um, the aorta in coming out of the heart has got a, a kind of bulge at the bottom. It's not just a tube coming out. It's, it's got this, this, this bulge, which would later be called the sinus of Valsalva, named after another scientist. And he saw it in many different species, and he wondered why this bulge occurred. It must have some kind of reason. And postulated that these same vortices were being formed when blood was coming out of the aortic valve, being ejected from the heart, and you, you get these little vortices. Um, and that they were actually closing the aortic valve and, and closing the leaflets. Because if, if you just pump blood straight out, then you'd get a bit of blood falling back before the leaflets closed again, and you get a bit of leaking every time back into the heart, but we don't see that. And it would be 450 years before um, some engineers built a working model um, where they could actually visualize little particles inside some water and saw these exact vortices that Leonardo had, had uh, imagined. And it's not a, not a recent field at all. You know, it's been thought about for, for hundreds of years. So it's all physics in the end. <laughs> it's all physics in the end, exactly. Well, isn't that, isn't that the, uh, the big joke that biology is just a specialized form of chemistry, which is a specialized form of physics? which is just maths, really. So uh, you can go even more fundamental than the physics. So thanks so much for this conversation. It has been really, really interesting. And also thanks to the Royal Institution. I've greatly enjoyed being here. And thanks, everybody, for watching. <laughs>